The text from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark may be best begun with a disclaimer. These words contain scenes of violence and may not be suitable for young children. Reader, hearer, discretion is advised. <laughs> this will give those uncomfortable with discussing demon possession, hell, and self-mutilation to tiptoe quietly out of the room. These are topics in the church that we'd rather not spend a lot of time on. We don't want to pursue them. We prefer to chalk up such topics as medieval or the stuff of stories designed to scare and frighten young children. Intellectually, we turn demons into allegories, hell into merely a separation from God and description of severed limbs into symbolic hyperbole. Saints, I, I, I don't want to give the powers of evil a, a, a great audience. I don't want to puff up evil with undue power and distinction, but nor do I wish to ignore the reality of demon possession. It would take a minute, but I'll tell you about a time I saw one for myself. You see, the church, we pause because the church has a long and unpleasant history of using accusations of demon possessions and or witchcraft to punish the most vulnerable among us. I think specifically of the uh, attacks on wealthy, educated women from the 14th all the way through the 17th century. These accusations uh, uh, of being a witch meant the loss of land, possessions, and usually life to those absolutely powerless to defend themselves. Also, many of us wrestle with demons who haunt our thoughts, tempt our minds, and tease our spirits. How many of you are waiting with juicy mouth for that new iPhone XX something, right? <laughs> How many of you use creams to reduce hair loss or remove wrinkles? Uh, have a reoccurring medical problem, financial difficulties, or struggles with food addictions, alcohol addictions, addictions to sex or power? <laughs> All of the aforementioned would be called demons in the first century. Let's consider what happens if we take this text at face value, shall we? Jesus and those following most closely are engaged in a discussion about receiving a child when John is distracted by the news someone is casting out demons in the name of Jesus. Okay. Someone is being healed, check. Someone is acting in a manner consistent with God's character, check. Someone acknowledges Jesus' name has power, check. I'm confused. What's the problem? It would appear that after all that they have seen and experienced at Jesus' side, that the 12, and specifically John, have no difficulty being judgmental and narrow. It looks like they want Jesus and the message of the kingdom all to themselves. 
you know, they were the experts, right? They're the experts, they're the authority, uh, and they saw no good reason to think otherwise. Jesus was walking with them. Jesus was teaching them daily. And, and, and still, they just don't understand. But you know, this is not the first time. This is not the first instance that power sharing has risen within the community of God. And unfortunately, it will not be the last. So remember, remember after Moses... Uh, registered 70 men as elders and then ushered those men into God's presence in the sacred tent, two men, Eldad and Medad, for some reason didn't make it into the tent. God's spirit came upon the two wherever it was they were and they prophesied. This caused such a stir, and Joshua, Joshua, remember Joshua was the next in command. Joshua wanted Moses to command those two to stop. I love her. I love Catherine uh, Sackenfeld. In her book on numbers, she says this, From the time of Samuel on to the post-exilic time, Israel's political and religious leadership struggled with the problem of prophets who they could not control. Ouch. Moses said, would that all of the Lord's people would be prophets. Jesus says, do not stop him. Different words, same sentiment. God's spirit, Christ's transformative power is not restricted to a select few or an elite group but has been given by God to all who believe and are ready to be a part of the kingdom that Jesus died to build. Jesus, not Mary, not Alfred, not George, not Elizabeth. Jesus died to build. We are not to stand in the way of anyone who wishes to participate. They may not do the work the way we would do it. They might not do it with the words that we would use. They might not play the same kind of music or use the same kind of instruments we're accustomed to. But if they do it in the name of Jesus, then the command of God is do not stop them. And then... You know, Jesus is kind of my favorite guy. Because then, with no evidence that Jesus does not still have a toddler cradled in loving arms, Jesus continues the message of caring for little ones. Little ones are to be welcomed. Little ones are not to be forbidden from working in the kingdom. Little ones are not to be caused to stumble. But if we do something so scandalous as the above, we are better off sleeping with the fishes. <laughs> we are better off without our hands, our feet, or our eyeballs. And then just for a bonus, don't forget to take care of your own mess uh, uh, and to be humble and peaceful with one another. Our grandmothers would say take 50% of the time taking care of your own business and 50% of the time staying out of other folks. Come on, saints, come on. Even in our austere and composed surroundings, we would have to admit that there are worse fates than missing a limb. Hmm. Well, Think of that one-armed surfer girl, right? Yeah. Or, or the Olympic runners with two prostheses. The text is graphic, it's violent, and maybe even a little offensive, but maybe that's because God wants this to be one of those times that the message is clear. Yeah, yeah. 
Our exclusionism has its dangers. And the Son of God would not have wanted our behavior, our attitudes, and our stubbornness to affect the successful growth of the kingdom of God. Jesus speaks the language of Leviticus 2 and 13, and if you just want to really have nightmares, read Leviticus <laughs> and find out all the things that you aren't doing that God commanded us to do. Amen. Leviticus 2.13, with all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Salt. Salt, uh, my brothers and sisters, was a precious commodity in the ancient world. Uh, and we, we, we don't need to say it because it goes without saying that salt was important for preservation of food. And has anyone ever tried to cook a chicken without a little salt? <laughs> I, I, I'd rather not. I'd rather not. Uh, 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 salt is so much more, though, than preservative and seasoning. Salt was used for medicine as an antiseptic to relieve respiratory diseases and digestive complaints. Roman soldiers were even paid in salt rations. Now, this is not no little sprinkling salt. They gave them a rock-solid piece of salt as pay. Preserving power is not as important as preserving faith. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Jesus wants us to have a rock solid faith. Yeah. The kingdom of God is before us accessible, available, and approachable. And I, for one, do not wish to enter into the glorious presence of God without a hand, without an arm, without a leg. I want to examine myself and my ministries for the small and subtle ways that I hinder little ones. I want to review how I see myself within the body so that I may present a message that reflects the changing landscape of the Christian family. If you haven't ever read the book, Love Wins. Love Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who ever lived. It's by Rob Bell. Uh, I, I, I need you to pick it up. I, I need you to pick up this book, it's a little book, it's, not, it's, it's a Monday read, as my family teases me about. You could read it on a Monday. You could read it on a Monday. It's a nice little book. But when the book came out in 2011, there was this huge controversy uh, uh, around it in the church, and there were accusations that the book represented a universalist view of salvation and that Rob Bell uh, no longer believed in Jesus Christ. Well, so you know that meant I had to buy the book, right? So I bought the book, I read it. Well, Rob Bell had me in the preface where he says, first, I believe that Jesus' story is first and foremost about the love of God for every single one of us. It is a stunning, beautiful, expansive love, and it is for everybody everywhere. Ah. <sighs> I think Rob Bell was onto something. Not blanket universalism, but a genuine look at what is essential about our faith. As followers of Jesus Christ, our first commitment is to the kingdom of God and the kingdom that God came to inaugurate and not to our individual theologies, our individual ecclesiastical positions, and our individual doctrinal creeds. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, agreed to a temporary separation from God the Father not to shield us, the disciples, from costly obedience, but to show us the way. Being a disciple can be the fire of sacrificial offering that purifies or like the salt which stings 
and smarts and sizzles and preserves. Known as the kingdom, we do exercise the demons of this world. We constitute a new social order based on reconciliation, economic and social justice, and we bring this about using servanthood and nonviolence. We strengthen our members, providing a place of identity, creating a place where we're known and recognized, protected and supported. We resist the tendency to restrict creativity and freedom. We do not wish anyone to lose their capacity to relate to those outside. We daily struggle to keep our integrity without isolating ourselves. We will not be a stumbling block, but we will endeavor to be a building block. Allowing our faith to be the solid footstools that others may stand upon to see Jesus more clearly and love God more sweetly with all of our hearts. We do this, my brothers and sisters. It's not us that do it. It's not in us alone, but it's God who is ultimate. God who loves us, always bringing us back to the heart of God to begin again and again. Little ones. Please come. We're ready. Please come. Amen. Amen. Amen.